The following sermon was presented on Sunday, March 18th, 2018, by Pastor Daniel Calcagno in Font Hill, Ontario, at Glad Tidings Church of God. It is titled, His Early Ministry, Part 1. For more videos, please subscribe to this YouTube channel and visit our website at gladtidingschurchofgod.com. So yes, as Jerry said, we are continuing our Go Deeper into the Gospel series. I want to, and we discussed this a little bit at our elders meeting, I, 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 I want to make sure that my messages to you, especially as we go through the Gospels, are relevant to you. So we're not going to spend perhaps as much time on every detail as we have been up until this point. But I still want us to go through the Gospels, and I'm going to bring out and hopefully point to the very specific things that are in there that will be relevant to us, especially as we're learning more about our relationship to God and how we can grow in that. So I hope that that makes sense to you, and please be patient with me as I try to learn how to, how to uh, you know, uh, tailor my Gospels towards uh, that end. But I want to begin with John chapter 1, verse 1. And I know we've looked at that before, so I wanted to do it from maybe a, a bit of a different angle, just give, give a fresh perspective of it. We know that the first verse, John begins his gospel with a prologue, unlike Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they just sort of jump right into the, 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 uh, the narrative. But John does this poetic prologue at the beginning of his gospel, and he begins with this famous verse. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. So what does he mean? What, what is he alluding to here? In the beginning. Where, do we, where else do we hear the words, in the beginning? Of course, it's Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. So he's alluding to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, when it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So what did God have to do? Who remembers what God did to create the heavens and the earth? What did he do? Shout it out if you know it. He spoke. So we find when God needed to create the world and order the world and separate everything and, and have it all be in its right place, it says that God spoke. God said. So all throughout the creation narrative, we read that God spoke the world into existence and into its ordered place. Now, so think about that. And we, we know this from our, from our daily lives. Think about this. When a person has authority... What they say has power. What they say will come to fruition, right? Think of any kind of CEO or boss or any, anybody in a position of authority. Even if you're a manager and you have people under you, if you say something, they, they have to do it, right? They will do it. They will respond to you. Your word has authority. What you say has authority. Think of a military person. What they say has to be obeyed and done. These are my orders. Or even... Captain Picard, when he says, make it so. The crew of the Enterprise will then have to do what he says, because he's the captain, and the, you have to do what the captain said. So God, how much more so, God, when he speaks, does his creation respond and do what he says, right? So, his creation obeys his word, and his word, his speech, is like an agent. It's, it's accomplishing what he desires, right? Doesn't that make sense? His word is like an agent. And you know what, what's an agent? Somebody who's representing you on your behalf. His word accomplishes his intentions and plans. This is why it says in Isaiah, for as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater, God says, so will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. So what is he saying? God's word, what he says, will accomplish his plans and purposes. Whatever he intends by those words, his words will be fulfilled. God's word accomplishes his will because it's an expression of himself. And our words are an expression of ourselves, right? What I'm saying to you is what I think and what I intend to convey to you. Now, the big difference between us and God is that we are prone to lie. Hopefully, I'm not lying to you. Hopefully, we, when we speak to one another, we're not lying to one another. But the difference is, we are prone to lie. We sometimes do say things that are false. God, however, only speaks truth. 
So whatever he says will indeed be a, a, a true representation of himself and it will accomplish his desires and his plans. So his word becomes manifested, becomes realized in reality. And, and where do we see this? We see this all throughout the Bible. In the Bible, in Genesis, God's word was manifested by the fact that the world was created. He created human beings. He created Adam and Eve. God's word was there, therefore manifested in Adam and Eve, but they touched, uh, as we touched on last week, they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They sinned. They, they disobeyed God. But God did not give up on us. His word was then manifested in the promises that he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the people of Israel. He made promises to them. And then his word was manifested in the giving of his commandments at Mount Sinai, right? He gave his instructions to his people. That's the word made into instructions. His word was manifested into commandments. But ha, ha, we know the story. Israel often disobeyed God. They did not follow his ways. And they will often go off and, and disobey God. And they will often misrepresent God's word as well, as, as I've tried to, to have us understand, is that sometimes Israel misrepresents what God said, right? So God did something spectacular, something that was indeed the plan from the beginning, but for various reasons, he had to wait until a certain time for this to happen. His word became flesh, right? John 1.14, that famous verse, the word became flesh. Flesh means human being. The word became a human being. The word of God became a living, breathing human being, a man begotten by God, but a man of his own will. Jesus is a real human being, but he is the word of God made flesh. Now, we looked at last week, Jesus endured temptation, right? He actually was tempted to sin, just like we're all tempted. And I would say even further, because none of us here are really tempted to take over the whole world. And Satan tried to tempt him that way. So he was tempted in every way, but he endured that temptation and never gave in to sin. So Jesus, in that sense, is the word of God made flesh because he perfectly reflects God to us and he perfectly lives out God's plan for our salvation. So I said, again, as I said, the word was manifested all these other ways in the Bible. That's God's word, his expression of himself, manifested in various other ways, but it's only perfectly manifested in the person of Jesus. And so... All these other ways, we can say this is why the Apostle John said that the law was given through Moses. Amen. That's a good thing. The law is a good thing. God's instructions. But grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. So, again, it doesn't mean that Jesus supersedes the law in the sense of doing away with it, but in the sense that Jesus perfectly shows us what God is like and what he expects of us and what his ways are. Or to put it differently, Jesus shows us what, how the law must be lived out. It's to be lived out through grace and truth. Without grace and truth, then we're, we're lost, right? We're not going to be following God properly. It is Jesus that shows us what God is like, as John said in 118. No one has ever seen God at any time. No one has seen God at any time. But Jesus has explained him. So this is why, and I hope this makes sense. This is why we're endeavoring to go deeper into the Gospels. Because if we want to know God, we have to know Jesus. And how can we know Jesus unless we ever study the books that tell us about him, right? Thank God for the personal relationship that we have with him. But that relationship must be informed by the Gospels, by the Scripture. So let's turn, just continuing on there in the book of John, verse 19 now. If you'll recall, last time, the last time we saw Jesus, he was coming out of the, the, the Judean deserts, or rather, he's still in the Judean deserts, but he's now no longer fasting, and he's now no longer being tempted by the devil. He overcame the temptation by the devil. He relied on scripture, and he faithfully obeyed God, and in that sense, he was able to overcome the temptation. So Jesus is still out there in, in the Judean deserts, but so is John the Baptist. That's where we left John the Baptist. We haven't looked at him in a few weeks. That's where John the Baptist currently is. And it says, we are told that the Jews sent to John the Baptist priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him this question, to ask him, who are you? 
So clearly John had had uh, some great effect upon the people of Israel. And so some of the leadership from Jerusalem came or was sent to ask John, who are you? Now I wanted to just center in on one thing here. You notice how I highlighted the word the Jews there? I want us to understand this. Just a very quick aside for the sake of understanding. We'll touch upon this probably a few other times in the future. When he says the Jews here, it's very possible. Like, first of all, the word comes from the Hebrew word, which means Judah, right? It's actually just re referencing the fact that these are the people who come from the region of Judea, Judah, in which there is the capital city of Jerusalem. Now, does that mean that the people who live outside of Judea aren't Jews, like the people who live in Galilee? No, but sometimes the Gospels here, especially the Gospel of John, will say the Jews, and all he means is the Jewish people who live in Judea, and specifically in Jerusalem, or even more specifically, the leadership there, the, the religious establishment. So I want us to keep that in mind, that this is a conflict between the Jews and John the Baptist, and later the Jews and Jesus, but guess what? John the Baptist and Jesus are also Jewish. <laughs> so this is an internal, in-family conflict. It's not Jews versus Christians, it's Jews versus other Jews. So I just wanted to make that clear because that gets misunderstood and boy has led to a lot of bad things in history. So we are not looking at the Jews versus somebody else. We're looking at Jews versus other Jews. Okay, so the Jewish people asked John, who are you? And John denies being the Messiah. He denied being Elijah. He even denied being a prophet, which is kind of strange because his father, Zacharias, said that he would be a prophet. So what is he saying here? He's trying to lower himself in order to elevate Jesus. He is not important. Jesus is important. Boy, is that something that we can learn as well. You know, I might be up here and I may, might be speaking loudly, but I'm trying to show you Jesus. I'm not trying to show you me. And that's what we should be doing in our lives. Show people Jesus, not ourselves. People will be disappointed if we just show them ourselves. So show them Jesus, and that way they can come to the truth. So John said, I am a voice. And we looked at this in the other Gospels. I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. So as I said, we looked at that when, when, he, when we read that in the other gospel. So we won't take too much time on that. The point is, is that he's leading the way. He's making a path for Jesus to come. Jesus, uh, John would, would be de de -ele or not elevated. He would be, what am I looking for, de-elevated? I don't know. He would be minimized and Jesus would be emphasized, right? John testifies about Jesus to, these Judean, the, to the Judean leadership. John is there with his own disciples. I, again, I, I know I mentioned that, but I think we forget that. John, the Baptist, had his own disciples, just like Jesus was to. In fact, a couple of the disciples, let me just show you here, a couple of these disciples then go to follow Jesus. This is what we're told. Jesus shows up on the scene there in the Judean wilderness where they were, and John says to his disciples, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, so he's telling his disciples, this is the Messiah. I'm not the Messiah. This is the Messiah. Now, why, was he, why would he call Jesus the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? How did he already know that Jesus was going to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? Did he have some special revelation? I, don't, I actually don't think so. I think he's simply alluding to Isaiah 53. That he is simply alluding to passages like, like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and that through Jesus' death, he himself bore the sin of many. So even though it wasn't totally clear to many people back then, it was clear to certain people, especially John here, that Jesus was going to be the lamb of God, just like a Passover lamb is slaughtered, and, and, and through that your sins are forgiven, if, so to speak. So through that you can, have, you can have life. Jesus, too, was slaughtered like a lamb, and through that, you could have forgiveness of sins and eternal life. So, John says to his disciples, this is the one. This is the one I was telling you about. I myself have seen, he said to his disciples, and have testified that this is the Son of God. How does he know? That's what we looked at a few weeks ago. When John baptized Jesus, the voice from heaven spoke, this is my beloved Son, and the Holy Spirit came and descended upon Jesus and landed on him. 
So John the Baptist knew Jesus was the one. Jesus is the Messiah. So, understandably, the disciples of John wanted to begin to follow Jesus instead. And they, they weren't doing that as any sort of slight against John the Baptist. It's just they were just listening to what he was saying you know, and following what he was saying. If John is a great person, but he's not the Messiah, and there's the Messiah, I think I'll rather devote myself to the Messiah. Does that make sense? So firstly, we are told about how two of John's disciples left Jesus or left John in order to follow Jesus. And we're, and we're shown, literally, they began following Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following, and he said, what, what, what do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which is translated means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, come and see. Actually, the word rabbi is a Hebrew word. It means great one, but it's a term of, an, uh, of respect. It means, uh, ultimately means a teacher. A rabbi is a teacher, a great one who is a teacher, title of respect. And John and Jesus were not the only rabbis out there who had disciples and were traveling around. This would have been a great honor in order to follow a, a prominent rabbi. So these two men recognized that in Jesus, that, that in Jesus was uh, everything John had just declared about him. And they ask him, where are you staying? Meaning, can we follow you? Can we become a part of your life? Right? They're not just literally asking, where do you live? They're asking, can we be a part of your life? Can we follow you as your disciples? And Jesus said, come and see. Now, I, I don't, again, don't want to read like, too much into that, but I really think that this is kind of the exchange between them to ask Jesus if they can be his disciples. And Jesus is saying, come and see. You know, do you really want to do that? Do you really want to become devoted to me? In other words, count the cost. And I think all of us have to ask ourselves, will we actually devote ourselves? Jesus says, come and see, be my disciples. But there's a sense in that that he's, that he's saying to us, are you sure? <laughs> If you want to be my disciple, as he will say in, in another place, you have to count the cost. You have to pick up your cross and follow me. Be ready to die. Be ready to give up your whole life. So he's asking these disciples, are you sure? Well, and if you do want to follow me, come and see. So they're excited. And we're told that one of these two disciples is Andrew. And we're not told who the other person was, but almost everybody believes that was John, the apostle John, who wrote the gospel of John. Uh, that's why he didn't say his own name, because he, he's writing about himself. Um, but the one who gets really excited is Andrew, and he goes to find his brother Simon, and he tells him, we have found the Messiah. And then Simon came and met Jesus, and Jesus said to him, you are Simon, the son of John, you, are, you shall be called Kepha. In the movie, he said Cephas. Uh, it's actually Aramaic for uh, so it's, you are Simon, son of John, you shall be called Kepha. Aramaic, the Aramaic word is Kepha, and in, in Greek it's Petros, which we transliterate into English as Peter. Both words mean rock. He's literally calling him, you are the rock. And, and we're not going to get into this today, but this is hilarious. Every single one of the disciples has a nickname like this, and they all sound like wrestlers' nicknames. <laughs> Peter is called the rock, right? And, and there's the sons of thunder. There's, a, there's all these different nicknames that are given to these disciples. These are, these, you, know, you have to imagine, these are young men who are traveling together and they're, they're becoming close friends and they're giving each other fun nicknames to distinguish. A lot of them had the same real name, so they had to distinguish each other, right? But there's also a very spiritual reason why Jesus called him the rock. And it's because, as he would say later on in, in the Gospel of Matthew, that you are the rock, and upon this rock I shall build my church. So we're going to look at that one day. But it's just important to know that Jesus is giving Peter here, or Simon, an identity. He didn't stop being called Simon. Shimon is a Hebrew name. And uh, he continued to be called that. In fact, he, he was called Simon Peter, Shimon Kepha. So Andrew leads Jesus, or leads Peter, to Jesus. You see how this works here? We're going to see this again, where somebody is led to Jesus, they get excited, and then they lead somebody else to Jesus. Look what happens here. We're told that the very next day that there was a man named Philip. Jesus called on Philip to follow him, and he did. 
Now, in the movie, and if you just read it, it seems kind of strange. Jesus, Jesus just walks up to Philip and says, follow me. And J Philip's like, okay, I guess. <laughs> but Philip would have understood what was happening here. So again, Jesus was a rabbi, a traveling teacher of the, of the scriptures. And it would have been a great honor for the rabbi himself to come up to you and say, follow me. Because what he would, was asking of Peter, or Philip here, was become my disciple. You know, basically live with me as much as you can so you can learn from me and learn the scripture through me. So this would have been a great honor and Philip was understandably excited and he went and saw his, uh, he met his, uh, his friend Nathaniel and he said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So who, what's he talking about? He, we have found the Messiah, the one whom Moses and the prophets wrote about. So Philip identified Jesus as the Messiah, as the one who was spoken of in the Hebrew scriptures. So Jesus' identity rests upon the foundation and authority of the Hebrew scriptures. This is why we must hold the Hebrew scriptures as, as sacred, as, as important. His whole identity as Messiah rests upon the foundation and authority of the Hebrew scriptures. Now, as we saw in the video clip, Nathaniel was a little surprised to hear that the Messiah could come from Nazareth. Can anything good come from Nazareth? <laughs> can anything good... I, I don't want to keep picking on Dunville. I'm sorry. Uh, can anything good come from Dunville? Uh, no. The, the idea is... Well, I'm not, not picking on Dunville. The point is, is, that, is that you wouldn't expect the king to come from some lowly town, Right? So Philip responds and says exactly what Jesus had said to Andrew and John. Come and see, right? So come and see. He's calling upon uh, Nathaniel here to come and encounter Jesus. This phrase, come and see, is important. And, and it's going to be uh, uh, important to us as a church as we're expecting. What kind of evangelism can we do as a church? Well, firstly, there's go tell evangelism. There's... For those of us who are extroverts, we can go out and tell people about Jesus, tell people about the Gospels. But then for the rest of us, because I understand, and this is what we're, we're going to call on all of you to do, and this is what we can do on April 1st, we can say to our friends and family, come and see. And what we're talking about is come to church, come to Glad Tidings, where you will encounter Jesus. Amen? This is the place, out of any place, where you should be encountering Jesus. Say to your friends and family, come and see. So Jesus then goes to meet Nathaniel or, or vice versa, and Nathaniel was able to identify him, or rather, Jesus was able to identify Nathaniel, and he said that he was an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. So Jesus had insight into his disciples. We learn this from the text. Jesus had insight into his disciples, even though he had never met these, some of these people before, right? And Jesus, and, and Jesus says to Nathaniel, I saw you under the fig tree, which was beautifully represented in that movie. You see a Nathaniel who was a devout Israelite. And what was he doing? Do you know what he was doing under the fig tree there? Who, who could tell? What was he doing wrapping the leather straps? Who could tell that he had something on his forehead? Did you notice that at all? It was really small. He was wrapping tefillin. That is a, the Hebrew and Jewish um, a custom of praying and, and putting scripture boxes on your head and on your arm. And it's a fulfillment of Deuteronomy 6 where it says the words will be on your head and on your, on your hand. So Nathaniel was a devout Israelite in whom there is no deceit. And Jesus says, I saw you under the fig tree. This must have been something private that... that Nathaniel had done that, no, that Jesus would not have known about. Because his response to him is, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. So we don't know exactly, like why would he have that kind of response? So we can infer, I'm assuming, it must have been something that only Jesus could have known through the Holy Spirit. That, that, that Nathaniel had been under the fig tree in, in seclusion in some way. So I want us to see this pattern. And, and this is Jesus' call to us. We've, we've looked at this pattern. People encounter Jesus. They recognize him as the Messiah. They choose to follow him as his disciple. And then they tell others about him because they're so excited. 
This pattern happened twice in, the, in this. So let's look at each of them. We encounter Jesus. None of us here have physically encountered Jesus like the disciples did, or even like Paul did, who had a great vision of Jesus or some kind of physical encounter with Jesus. So it is possible for, for many people to go through life and never give a, a second's thought to Jesus. Isn't that true? Even us can go through our week and we're not even thinking about Jesus. Why? Because he's not literally here. He's not in our lives. We can get busy and we're not even given a thought to Jesus. But some of us here, and I would hope all of us, have the opportunity to spiritually encounter Jesus in our hearts and in our lives. Amen? That through the Holy Spirit, we can encounter Jesus. It is, it is a bizarre thing, I understand. But it's for some reason, through the Holy Spirit, we can have the sense that we know Jesus. Right? And we can encounter him. And that's, we can also encounter him in the scriptures. And that's why I'm presenting to you the things that he did and things that he said in the Gospels. So firstly, we encounter Jesus. It's the first step. But then you must recognize Jesus. You must recognize him. So these men, Andrew, John, Peter, Philip, and Nathaniel, they recognized Jesus as the Messiah. So I, I wonder, will we recognize him as the Messiah, as the King of Israel, as the Son of God. He is the Word of God made flesh, right? So through Jesus, God has been and is and will be saving us. And the whole world will be transformed. God's kingdom will be established and Jesus will be King. So do we recognize that in our lives and in the way we act, in the way we speak, in the way we, we do things? So... Was he just a good teacher, as many people might say? Was he just a historical figure? Or was he indeed the Son of God? Was he indeed the Messiah? Will you recognize, and here's the other part, especially for evangelism, will you recognize what he did on the cross? Will you recognize that God raised him from the dead? So we encounter Jesus, right? We go through life, we don't know anything, we don't think about Jesus, but then we suddenly we encounter him. And then we recognize him, secondly. And thirdly, we follow Jesus. Jesus. If you recognize him for who he truly is, and you recognize what happened to him, that he died on the cross, and, and how he was raised from the dead, then the logical next step is, I want to do what he did. I want to follow him in my life. If you commit yourself to Jesus in every area of your life, right? Have we done that? In every area of our life, do we think to ourselves, what would Jesus do? It's not just a, a bracelet you can wear. It's a, it's a, it's a life motto. So, Will we get on board with who and what, who Jesus is and what he did and how he has real, begun to realize God's amazing plan for salvation and how we can be a part of that? Because if we are on board, are you on board with what Jesus is doing? Because if you are, then we should then evangelize for Jesus. If you have come this far, if you've encountered him, if you've recognized him, if you've followed him, then why not also evangelize for him, right? Will you tell people the good news, the gospel, that Jesus is coming back soon and that through faith in the cross and faith in the resurrection that we can have forgiveness of sins, that if we repent of our sin, that we can be forgiven, that we too can have a place in the resurrection when Jesus returns. So get this, I want us to know that if you do go this far, there's great reward for us if we do. We will be a part of the coming kingdom, when it, the kingdom when it comes. The kingdom... In the king, so I want us to think about this. This is so interesting. I, I, you, think, you might think that this is me taking it, uh, what's that expression, uh, going uh, on left field. What's that expression? On a tangent? Yeah, going on a tangent. But uh, I'm telling us here that we should encounter Jesus, recognize Jesus, follow Jesus, and then evangelize for Jesus. And if we do, we will have great reward in the kingdom. And in the kingdom, bear with me here, there is wine. There's king, in the kingdom of God, there will be great and awesome wine for us to drink. In fact, there's a Jewish tradition. See, Sarah's face is demonstrating to me that I am going off on a tangent. What is this? <laughs> Believe me, I'm connecting it to something in the text. There will be wine for us to drink in the kingdom. In fact, the Jewish tradition says, and it's just a tradition, but I think it's really interesting, that the wine we are going to drink, first of all, according to Isaiah, so it's scripture, that we will drink aged wine in the kingdom of God, right? But according to Jewish, Jewish tradition, it's from the grapes that were there in the Garden of Eden. 
We will drink of the wine made from grapes that, is, that was from the Garden of Eden in the first six days of creation. Now, why am I saying this? Because his first miracle, it's no coincidence, I don't think, actually, that his first miracle was to turn water into wine. We were told in John chapter 2 that Jesus and his disciples were invited to a wedding in the, in the town of Cana of Galilee, of Galilee, in the region of Galilee. During the meal, the wine ran out. Oh, no. <laughs> so Jesus had them after, uh, we're not going to look at the text, but Jesus had them fill up the pots with water, and suddenly the water turned into wine. The implication is, because it just kept coming, there's just more, the more water you poured in, the more wine would come out, the implication is, if with Jesus, there is unending wine. Now, wine in Judaism is a symbol of joy. It, it represents joyfulness. And so the implication, again, is that with Jesus, there is unending joy. That, that with Jesus, you can have unending celebration. And why do we know that's true? Because when he returns, the kingdom will come. And there will be no more, and eventually, there will be no more death no more tears, no more mourning, as it says in the book of Revelation. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not necessarily talking about real wine. And I'm sorry if that's disappointing to anybody. I don't know if there will be real wine that we're going to drink in the kingdom. I'm not, I'm, that's not my point. My point is what it symbolizes. It symbolizes that we will have unending joy with him. And that, that's, I think, part of the reason why Jesus turned water into wine to demonstrate and to symbolize that with him comes unending joy that he will turn our despair into joy. And if you believe that he did that, that, that through that sign, through the glory that was manifested in him, you can believe in him. That's what it says, that, that through this sign, Jesus manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. This is something that you're going to find all throughout the, the Gospel of John. Just one quick last thing here. It's then apparently time for Passover, just like it's time for Passover for us in a couple weeks. In the rest of John chapter 2, we're told about how Jesus went to the temple and he became angry with the money changers and he overturned the tables. Now, this is really strange because this, in the other Gospels, happens later, just before his crucifixion, right? So, I don't know what this is. Is this out of, chrono is this out of chronological order or did it, do, did it happen twice? The point is, we'll look at that another time later when we get to later in the Gospels. I want to look at what Jesus said to the Judean leadership when they confronted him after that. They said, or rather, Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. So the Judean leadership thought he was talking literally about the temple, that he was going to destroy the temple. He's talking about himself. That if he himself was killed, destroyed, that he would raise it up again on the third day. In three days, I raise it up. And so then after he died and came back to life, God raised him from the dead. It says this. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. So let's have Paul and Sarah come, because we're going to sing one last song called This I Believe. And I, and I, I want us to ask, do we really believe as the disciples as it says of the disciples here, do we believe the scripture and about what Jesus had said? Because if we don't, how are we supposed to share that with others? And if we don't share the gospel with others, how are we ever going to see the kingdom grow? Amen? And our church grow. That's so important. You know, and I'm talking to myself here. You know, I, I, even yesterday, I had an opportunity to, to just talk to, I saw something, somebody reading something that I have a common interest in. I could have used that and said, I'm also interested in that, and then somehow brought the conversation to the gospel. And I remember us walking out of that place, and I, I, I literally said, that was a missed opportunity. I should, have, should, I should have walked back in and started talking to him, right? So I'm te preaching to myself here. We each need to have a focus on telling others and being open to them. And at the very least, if we're not comfortable with that, right? Hopefully you become comfortable over time. But if, even if not, you say, come and see what we're doing at Glad Tidings. And then we'll present the gospel here. So let's stand together and let's sing this last song.